Right, so we have our problem. Uh, this morning, I was making, I was on the last row of cows, and all of a sudden, the pulsation stopped. Just completely cut out. All pulsation was lost. Thankfully, uh, the cows, the last row were kind of three quarter away of milk, uh, but once the pulsation went, it just completely cut out, and I had no pulsation then. So this pipe that runs down here, and goes through this, what we call a shell, um, and comes out the end here. This is basically what's inside there. And if you've ever seen a cow being hand milked, um, one of the things you'll see is when someone's hand milking a cow is they have to squeeze to draw the milk out of the cow. And this is just a mechanical version of that. So the teeth goes in here, and then this shell here, there's a void between here and here. So inside here you have a chamber, and in that chamber you've got a pipe that's feeding air between the chamber and this rubber. And this air is pulsated, so it pulsates. Um, a suction in and out around this chamber and that squeezes on this as it sucks and that squeezes the cow's teeth and draws the milk out of the cow. Without that squeezing the cow wouldn't milk. Um, all you'd have is a constant squeeze like that there. So the pulsation allows it to stop, start, stop, start. So that's basically what your pulsation is. It's quite a simple thing when it's working. When it's not working you're in trouble. Used to be an older milking machine you'd have a pulsator for each cow. Not anymore. Basically, what you have is you have a pulsation unit, an electronic unit outside, and then you have a whole bunch of regulators per cow. This regulator went in fire, and um, that's why it's a newer model compared to the rest of them. They're alpha valve, which would have been from an older milking machine that I bought. But then Della Valve took over, it's the same brand, just changed the name to Della Valve. So I had to put a new regulator on there. Complete mystery why that happened, but it did happen. The machine was running at the time that it happened and it was there to put it out, but I had to get a new regulator and put it in. That's not the problem today. If there was a problem with the regulator, it'd just be one regulator. Uh, it wouldn't be the whole lot, just stop. So um, I knew that it definitely wasn't a regulator problem. So the first thing I done was, him to the feed that's coming to the first regulator, run into this box, checked it, and there was completely no voltage whatsoever coming in. So. Went back, the next thing was to basically go in here, into where the electronic unit is. Now, you have two uh, electronic units here at the minute. So what you have is, the way I have it wired is, we have a main switch, an isolator switch for the pulsator. That one's for the machine and this for the pulsator. So the first thing I had to check to make sure there was power there. Took that all apart, seeing that there was power there, there was power coming in and there was power going out. Here you have a guy, I think that what that does is reduces it from mains to 12 volts. I'm not positively sure. Check the voltage coming out here and we had volt, voltage coming out so I knew this was more or less okay. Uh, I wasn't 100% sure but I was kind of 99% sure that there wasn't any problem in there. The next thing was the thing I didn't want to have to look at which is the master unit. It's a full control board full of resistors and stuff you just do not want to be touching. These should be flashing when the machine's working. I'm going to show you it now in a minute. The only thing I could do was literally clean it and check all the terminals to make sure that there wasn't any wires loose because I certainly couldn't touch them resistors because that's a job for a real professional and not a job for someone like me. So I had a route around in there and had a good look and everything looked spotlessly clean. No issues I could find. Literally I had to walk away from it because I couldn't find the problem. But I'm going to turn on the machine now. It's going to be very loud but I'm going to show you where I did actually find the problem. So the machine's running now. I hope you can hear me over because it's right behind me here and you can see no light, it's shining but you have a switch here on the side fit, you know, and that switch is never used because you have an isolator here that does that job but if you watch carefully when I move it slightly on it comes see it's on now and it's not working and there it goes again so we know there's a short somewhere in that switch so that's what the problem is. Now, I have to have a, take this apart again and have a look, see what type of switch that is and see if I can bypass it. An isolator switch here, it doesn't necessarily need that. I've never touched that in the entire time this has been in. Now, if you look at this unit, you'll see that it's alpha valve. This is a unit that would be very, very expensive, um, but I got it uh, along with the second-hand power that I bought before I built this unit here in 2009. Um, I bought a parlor in 2006 and it was an old alpha valve parlor but it was a really good one and I bought the entire unit and I used a lot of the components that are on the new milking machine there now. Uh, milk pipes and things of course they were all changed, the jars were all new but the mechanical pipes like these here were all second hand which 
saved me a lot of money when I was building the parlour. This unit here, one of the things that were second hand. So, but it's really good condition inside. But you know, it's getting old. It could be thirty years old. This I don't know exactly what it'd be. We'll open it up and have a quick look. Turn off all the power and see what's inside. And just purely for safety, I'm going to go in here and cut the whole power just to make sure there is no possibility of any stray electric. A bit dark in here at the minute because my light is not working. All right, now you have to be also careful of this electronic board because just because you have the power cut doesn't mean that there won't be any power in this. There are parts of this that will still retain power and um, so you just have to be really careful not to really touch anything in there if you can help it at all but I am going to have to probably remove um, this circuit board just slightly out of the way um, just to get in at this properly and see can we get at this switch. This is the switch that we have to remove so we screw this off here first. So I can tell with that switch just even by moving it back and forth that it just isn't crisp. It's tight and it's, this seems to be worn out. I don't have one of those. I'm going to have to order one of them specially. But for now all I have to do is take off these two wires and just basically bypass the switch so the machine works. And at least that'll keep us going until we get the replacement. So I'm just making a little patch lead. Got a little bit of cable that's the same size. And I'm putting two little flat spade heads on each end. That way I can bypass the switch for now. It'll just replace where the switch was. Should fix the problem. Insulated covered and wrapped in place. So I'm gonna stick that back in there and we'll get this back into place and we'll test to see is it working. Power back on. <laughs> One thing I have to do when I'm here, get the remainder of that milk. On our, our cap. Put this tank in a wash as well. Ah, there it goes. So hopefully these LED lights are a lot better. Yeah, get a bit more power out of it. Okay, this is an overflow bucket fire making machine. So that hangs up onto the pipe um, and any time the pump maybe doesn't kick in or something like that happens and you get an overflow, uh, instead of it getting to the vacuum pump, it gets to this bucket and fills this bucket first. And then when the machine turns off, this drops down and it drains itself. But we have a problem. This is an old bucket and it's definitely starting to show its age. You can see here where I have this kind of it's a putty metal. This is the type of stuff that it is here. So it's EP200 epoxy putty. And I've mixed it up a few times because we are getting small little holes into the actual bucket itself. There's another one over here you can see. It's quite got quite big. Um, and you cannot have holes and lose vacuum on a machine. Dort making its way, getting sucked up and making its way into the vacuum pump. Or even worse, cell count getting risen on cows because the vacuum isn't regulated properly so it's a big problem another thing about this bucket is you can see the way it's bowled up now big time in the middle here it's actually supposed to be um out outwards from the bottom of that or at least flat and um, so that's just pure suction pulling it up it's just the floor is completely worn down inside and it's just et away um and that's causing it so i have a new bucket order uh, a plastic one plastic version this time so i'll have to wait a couple of days for that to come and um, so i'm going to redo them fix this hole as well and hopefully that'll do for a few days so our new bucket comes and hopefully get our new bucket before Christmas. So let's get on that. Hardness in the middle. So to activate it, you just mix it up. So first hole. Okay. That's them holes all fixed. So one way to know if you have any more holes left is to 
turn it up. Try to do this with one hand. Face it towards the light. And there's no light, apart from the wee bit of light in the middle and that's the plug hole. Yep, that's fine. Isn't, this plug hole isn't working either correctly because it has all shrunken in and it's not fit to get a proper seal on it, which isn't great. I'm going to try to tap this down ever so slightly, try to get a better seal on it. Right, it's a lot better than what it was. We'll get it back on the machine. Right, so we're over here on the other farm. It is very windy, so I hope you can hear me. We're gonna get this door fixed. What we have to do is obviously take this string off for starters. So my idea here now is to this is broken off. So there's a little lug that fits in there, and you weld it on from the back. So I have to cut this piece off here, take it home, put the new lug in, and put it back together again. So I don't want to take the welder out today because it's, it's a very rough day and it's raining quite heavy there at times. So I don't want to take the welder out until I really have to. So I'll take this apart now, weld it at home in the shed, and then I'll come back and just all I have to do is tack it onto place and that should fix the problem. There we are. All right, so we have it home. This is a little piece we're just after cutting off the door, um, and this is the new piece we're going to be putting on. You put this in here, and then you weld it from this side, and then you weld this box, piece of square steel, back onto the door, and that should be it. It should be in place. But this here, I'm just wondering. Is that cast or is that mild steel? To me it looks like cast and if it is, these rods are not going to weld that. Anyway, give it a go, see what happens. So that's it, we've got a nice bit of weld on there now. Next thing we do is grind it flat so we can get it welded nice and flat against the door. So that's it welded. It's in place. I'm not overly happy with that. It's a good weld on the back. That's not the problem. But the problem is I'm thinking that that's cast. And if that is cast um, cast iron, it is not going to weld to that. It seems to be holding, but that might be the reason why the last one fell off so easily. Right, grind this down a little bit better, and then we get this welded on to place. Alright, so I'll grind it down a piece here just to get a good air. The most important thing is a good air. That's a lot better. Don't need to use the chain because this is already here. It should just pop in. This does. Not gonna move. 
So you want to just look at the welds. You see, I use a little inverter welder. It's very, very easy on power. And you can see there, the welds are nice, nice clean welds. It does a great weld. Uh, boom, job done. So loads of people ask me about the type of welder that I use. Well, I've had loads of different welders over the years. I've had this one for the past six, seven years. This is my first inverter welder. So um, I have to say, if you're buying a welder nowadays, inverter is the way to go. It's just so much easier in power. It won't burn out, out any of your sockets like the bigger um, welders will do. So inverter is just, it's just so handy. The thing is so light. Uh, you can bring it anywhere. You can throw it in the back of a, of a, of a car and go wherever you like with it. It's just so mobile. And um, this one is a Jefferson, um, so it's a 160 amp, and to be honest with you, that's pile is enough ampage for kind of doing jobs like I'm doing here, DIY, more than DIY, for doing jobs around the farm. I have made loads of bale spikes for actual people, um, I used to make bale, uh, quite a lot of bale spikes and sell them to um, different lads, but I've met a few over the last couple of years, and I've met them all with this, welding constantly all day long, not a problem, never heats up. It's just a great, great little welder. When you look at an inverter welder, if you don't know what it is, you might say, God, it's very small looking. How can that replace my big welders that I see at home? It will replace it. It will blow it out of the water. They're just super, so they are. So you have a little dial in here that's very simple to use. Um, where you can adjust your ampage from 30 amp up the whole way to 160. Um, so it's very, very simple, very straightforward to use. Um, not sure exactly how much I paid for this, but I bought it on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description if you want to go over there and look at the price of it. And if you want, you can go over there and buy it through that link. Um, save yourself a few pounds. You can look around as well online if you want and see can you compare prices. Now it may look banged up and everything. That's because I literally throw it everywhere. Here in the back of the quad, and it's just locked around everywhere. But it never stops. And that's what's important. It's never once given me any trouble. So this is the helmet that I use. It's a Powerweld XR. 935H. I wouldn't worry too much about the about the brand of it. Just get yourself a good welding mask. This is the one that actually self tints. So when you come along and start welding, you can see in there there's there's different uh, dials where you can turn in on the density. So how dark you want the glass, and obviously how quick you want the glass to darken when you start welding. A density. Uh, the only reason you would turn it down like to this here, I suppose, if you're doing a bit of grind work or that, then it can act as a shield instead of darkening. And um, that's a very good handy feature. This on this one. Um, so if you're grinding, you don't have to keep changing your shield. You can swap it to grind and then turn it back up again. And I normally keep it pretty much close to the top because you want to protect your eyes as best as possible. Another thing on it is it's solar powered so i know it's a bit dirty at the minute it does need a good clean but as i say it's been through the ringer it's been flung back and forth everywhere but there's a solar panel in there so every so often you want to leave it in a bright place let it fully charge up and away you go not an overly expensive mask either but uh, i think they're great over the handheld masks oh there's no comparison just get yourself one of these self tints and you won't know yourself Welding rods, this is the brand I've used, I suppose, way back, oh, years now. I can't even tell how many years it is. I'm a long time welding, um, but I always use 3.2s. Find them just a nice, versatile rod um, for doing this kind of work. Keep them in a dry place, keep any moisture away from them as best you can. Even you wrap them in a bit of clean film or anything you have to do, um, keep them in, keep them dry, and that's the most important thing. So that's it, that's my welder. If you have any questions on it, feel free. Stick the comments down below. There are other inverter welders out there that are every bit as good, if not maybe even better. But Jefferson is one brand that I really like. That one, by the way, comes with a big hard case as well. I've never used it. I've put the hard case up onto the attic of the parlor, but I suppose I should be using it. Be right, looking after it, maybe a little bit better. Everything's good on it and it's working, and that's the main thing. It works, it does its job. I'm really, really glad that. Ah, Jesus, don't bite my hand. <laughs> Thankfully today worked out all right in the end. Um, it's just, it just was one of those things. It could have went either way and sooner or later it probably is going to eventually um, get me to look into it a bit further. But for now, thank God, it's all right and we're back in action. It's just the old pet. She's doing well after her clipping. They're all doing well. They're all starting to shine up now. The coats are starting to fall off. It's just, there's no itching. I know there's no itching going on among them. And they seem to be really, really content. Um, so yeah, the tipping is just out on its own. 
I'm going to head home now and get set up for milking again. It's hard to believe the taste just seems so short this time of year, especially when you're heading in for Christmas. Congratulations to those four people got themselves a hat uh, for Christmas as well. They're all posted out now and you should have them before Christmas comes in. Hard luck anyone didn't get one. Love to fit to give one to every one of you, but fortunately just can't do that either. But I do appreciate you all taking part. I think we had something near 900 comments and they're still coming in. Some people don't realize the competition is over. It is over, so you don't have to answer anymore. But thanks very much everyone that took part. I'm going home now to talk to a man who's coming to look at our case to see what kind of tires we can put on. He's going to also look at our quad as well. And we're going to discuss different types of tires that maybe we could use on them. So that's something that's coming up. Maybe you'll enjoy in the next few weeks. So if you want to see them kind of things, make sure you're subscribing. If you do like our videos, hit that like. Comment down below. You can follow us on Snaplap, Book of Faces and Top Tick. We are all there. See you later.